I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of an electromagnetic launch system. This is where you use the power of electricity to accelerate a mass. And look, it's a staple in science fiction. And scientists and engineers have been working on this problem for decades. You can go back into NASA archives and see technical papers on electromagnetic launch systems back into the 60s, the 50s, and yet they've just never worked. And the problem is, is that the energies involved, the forces involved are really, really powerful. How can you accelerate objects using electricity to tens of kilometers per second and not have your entire launch facility tear itself apart? Well, there's some new advances that might work on this with low temperature superconductors, new materials, new ideas. So to talk about them today, I'm joined by David Dillon, who is with Electromagnetic Launch, and they believe they've got the solution to an electromagnetic launch system that will function and be repeatable and reusable, and not just here on planet Earth, but maybe this technology could work on the moon or in space. So enjoy this conversation. It's a fairly frank conversation about just how difficult this technology is to get right. And yet, if we can solve these problems, then the benefits will be huge. Imagine you just accelerate payloads off into space with purely electricity. So enjoy this conversation with David Dillon from Electromagnetic Launch. The idea of an electromagnetic launch system is like such a mainstay in, in science fiction. Uh, but it's real, right? Or maybe that's where the idea came from. Oh, it's real. Uh, it's, a, it's a real idea, but it, it's had a troubled past. Um, the fact of the matter is there was a lot of over, over promising and under delivering with rail guns. And, you know, that kind of poisoned the water for a lot of folks. They just didn't believe there was any way to go about this. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars got spent on railgun research, railgun production, and quietly the Department of Defense ended the the research, the basic research into railguns quite some time ago. I mean, they, I had seen stories about like railguns being used for ships, like as a possible right, um, right. replacement for like the big guns on a battleship. Right. And there's a technical set of technical problems that make it unworkable, so it seems. Um, a rail gun is, is the simplest of all electric motors. It's just a pair of rails with, you put power to it and then you put whatever projectile you want to fire between them. It creates a contact and, and it's the Lorentz force, right? So the right hand rule, whoosh, out it goes, but it's in contact with the projectile being thrown. And although you can fire one a few times very well, you get rail wear and it's a significant problem. And there's been a lot of effort to try to resolve that. That's not the only problem. Um, as you get to higher and higher energy levels, you know, the detritus that comes out behind the projectile creates a restrike, slowing everything down. And people tried to find ways to encompass the, the, uh, the, the plasma, you know, hold it to the rail and that kind of stuff. But it, it became clear. Um, I remember, uh, Dr. Harry Fair telling the story of uh, a general saying, if you guys bring in a sheet of metal, you've blown a hole through one more time, I'm going to go crazy because it, it wasn't the issue. It was the robustness of it. And That's so, really interesting to me. Sorry, I, I had no idea. Like, And I know exactly what you're talking about, that there's, you know, we have all of these examples of it's not the generating the velocity it's the making something that can be reused again and again and again to bring those. Right. Those well, and for orbital launcher, it, for, for orbital launch, it's both velocity and using it over and over and over. Right. right. From a right, DOD right. perspective, they don't need to put things into orbit necessarily to find it useful. But yeah, the robustness thing is a real thing. And unfortunately, you know, I, um, they did not bring research down to some low level and just persist. Um, they just brought it, brought it to zero. There's still engineering efforts and there's still good applications for rail guns for launching aircraft and other kinds of things. But um, at, at the really high velocity ends, high energy ends of things and where you want repeated use, a different approach was required. And 
I got involved in this um, many years ago. Um, I have an entrepreneurial background and I was writing up patents to save money on a, on a business called Verify Brand. It was an anti-counterfeit business. And I had been involved in science fiction and, and reading all the science kinds of things I could. And I just couldn't figure out why electromagnetic launch didn't work. Long story short, I, I applied for a patent and received one. Turned out to be a dumb patent anyway. I didn't even you know, do anything with it after that. But it led me on a journey of why doesn't this work? And the journey had me go. I started with Graham Candler at the University of Minnesota, a guy you maybe ought to interview. He is the, the guy in the world on hypersonics. He not only is sought after by government and private industry, it's his software that people use to, as you can imagine, doing wind tunnels for hypersonics is not really something you can do very easily in a sustained way, right? You can do an explosion and send high speed particles past something. But so his software that models that is what's used. And I went to Graham to say, is the problem if you hit the atmosphere at five or six or seven kilometers a second, you're just going to fold up like a pop can. Is that, is that why this, no one can do this? And no, that's not the issue. Um, I, I can talk more about that if you're interested, but what he said was you really should go talk to the people at university of Texas. They're the ones who know the most about this. And he made some introductions and I, I just followed it up and I met Mehmet Erangel and uh, Dr. Harry fair and uh, others who, were very involved in these programs, but when the program got defunded, they of course scattered. Some retired and are doing horse farms and others are other places, but that's what happens. And they had another idea. They had another approach, this quench launcher or quench motor as I've taken to calling it recently, which is an entirely different principle and it's a non-contact thing. The, the Lorentz motor, the rail gun, it, the core problem with it really is that it's inefficient. It's like 30%, 37% efficiency is all you're ever going to get out of it. Well, the rest of that, that turns into heat, you know? And so there was a different approach. Um, actually, it was invented by a guy named Henry Kolm out of MIT. And it's called the quench launcher. And... Um, the easiest way to explain it is that it's quite similar to the idea of a solenoid or a coil gun. Um, you know, for those in your audience who don't know if you've got a, a, a donut, a solenoid, and then an iron bar or a magnet you want to pull through it, you can charge up that solenoid. And, every, you know, they work on your cars. They lock doors. Right. They, that's a generator. Yeah. And yeah. it'll pull it through. The problem is, of course, it'll pull it back, right? You'll end up with a doorbell instead of a launcher. You have to have some way to have it continue on. Mm. And that that's what gets you into um, what's happened recently, recently meaning the last years, um, in high temperature superconductors. If you want to build one hell of a solenoid, you can. The amount of power you can put in a superconducting ring is enormous. Um, bring your cast iron fry pan into the MRI machine area and somebody's going to get hurt. You know, it's a, a serious amount of power stored in those rings. So the, the, the advantage of the quench launcher was many fold. Um, it really wasn't doable, I don't think, before the current crop of high temperature superconductors became available, but they did. And you can quench a superconductor um, by heating it up, but you can also quench it other ways. You can quench it with electromagnetic energy. You can quench it with too much current. You can quench it with- Can you explain what this quenching is? Like, what does oh, it mean yeah. when you say you're quenching so, a, a, a coil? So if you, they, they take a lot of effort to protect an MRI machine from accidental quenching. Um, you know, there's, enormous amounts of power in the ring going round and round and it'll do that for a decade and just never there's no resistance it'll just sit there if you keep it cold enough if you accidentally let it get warm 
all that power is going to come out because the the superconductors, when they're not superconducting, aren't necessarily that great of a conductor. It's coming out somewhere and you don't want to be around when that happens. So that would be an accidental quench event. So I'm I'm talking about changing a superconductor from being a superconductor to not being a superconductor. Right. So you're and intentionally so, letting your superconductor warm up to the point that is no longer functioning as a superconductor. Well, we're intentionally quenching it. We probably wouldn't do it by warming it up. Um, stopping it, the quench term I, I is guess, I guess the, I'm sort of a little t hung up on the term. Like when I think quench, I think of like blacksmithing and you take yeah. your iron and I you put know. it I, into the yeah. oil and it, you know, makes this, this fizzing and now it is tempered it and cooled it down a bit and then you can go yeah. again. So I don't, I'm trying to I think sort of like what, like what are you doing? You're changing it from being a superconductor to not being a superconductor. Right. That's and, it. And the, and the mechanism can be putting energy into it. It can be. Yes. Right. Okay. And, and it could, be, you can actually uh, do it multiple ways, but the, the key sort of takeaway is that a high temperature superconductor, when it's a superconductor, has zero resistance. It's a remarkable freak of nature. But when it stops being a high uh, superconductor, it's not that great of a conductor. It's not as good as copper. Huh. It, it's, it's interesting. It's not. Yeah, it's it. it um, and there's some physics that underlie all of that. And I don't know that it's really perfectly understood. But the fact of the matter is. If you wanted to use a coil, like an old style coil gun, and you wanted to launch a projectile with coil, 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 you'd have to have all these capacitors lined up along it and dump the power into each coil to shove it along. Well, the beauty of this approach is that all the high temperature superconducting rings, the stators, right, can be charged up in advance and, and readied to go all the way up the launch tube. So they're all pre-powered, they're all ready to go. And then the, there's a little diagram on our website, but you can, in our case, the armature is the carrier sleeve, the sleeve that drags whatever it is you want to put into orbit. Um, and okay, so, okay, so I think I understand. So, you, so essentially you've got MRI machines aligned in a, in a tube right. and they're, they're all running superconductors and the, you know, right. the, the superconducting is, is on. Yep. And then as your projectile is moving past these superconductors, you are quenching the each one exactly in series and turning it off and no longer having it act like a break as this projectile is moving past. Exactly. Instead of right. a solenoid, it's pull, 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 pull all the way up. Right, right. right. And if you're and no longer helping, you turn off. Yes. Got it. Okay. So that, that's it in a, in, a, in a nutshell in terms of how it operates as a device. And um, it, it, it has, uh, how do I say this? The physics are absolutely solid. The engineering is seriously daunting. Um, <laughs> right. So, I mean, are you, is this back to showing uh, metal with holes in it and, and no, a I lot of so. damaged uh, MRI machines? Fact, we, we just, when we did our experimental design, one of the, one of the, important parameters was that we wanted to develop a, a demonstrator that you could run and run and run and run and run it a hundred times and then 500 times because people are going to look at it with the john's view i've seen this before you know and it's like no but you come and watch we're going to run it again and again and again and again because you know what it's an electric motor the electric motors are phenomenal in two regards not, you know not all of them but the good ones are are um, super efficient you know, you get way into the 90% efficiency bracket with a properly designed electric motor. And then they're super durable. Um, you know, Tesla's electric motors are rated for a million miles. So the whole idea is that this thing has to be robust. Um, the, the key measure for us is um, low cost per pound to orbit. And the key way to low cost per pound to orbit is reusability without maintenance without repair refurbishment we have to run it and run it and run it and run it and then we get incredible numbers per pound um to orbit so 
Right. So let's talk about that. So so let's say that you do work through the monumental engineering challenges um, and get yourself to a place where you are able to um, launch payloads into into orbit. What what does do you think that the launch system would look like and how would it function? Well, um, let me give two different examples. And why don't I start with a lunar launch first, because I think that might be the one that happens first. Um, you know, um, well, let me start over because maybe it makes sense to say an Earth launch first and then explain why lunar launch is so much well, easier. Well, I, mean I mean, the escape velocity on the moon is like, a fraction. 1.5 kilometers per second, right? Like right, it's, it's right. On Earth, it's sixth. eight. On yeah. Earth, it's yeah. pushing eight. And on the moon, it's 1.7. So right there is a right. huge, so it's one, huge, Yeah, huge. it's one-sixth, right? And then, and the other thing on Earth, you'd need a vacuum tube. The thing would, you know, no, no one knows at this point, but it's going to be hmm. 10, uh, 15 kilometers long, easy, maybe, maybe more. Um, and that's to get to those high velocities, right? So... Um, and it's also a vacuum tube. And of course, on the moon, no vacuum. Necessary. Comes with a vacuum tube. Right. right. So you could put a launcher like this in an extremely remote area um, on on Earth. But the, the fact of the matter is it's not going to be a neighbor anybody wants. I mean, every time it goes off, it's going to go kaboom. And you can say, yeah, but it's out near the you know, the pipeline in Alaska and way far away. And it's like, yeah, but you know what? There's people there, too. So it's it's going to be a difficult thing in terms of a NAMBI issue, even even if it holds out the promise of um, delivering to orbit at four dollars a pound and being world changing in terms of what's available in terms of space technology. People are going to object to having it in their yard, so um, it's going to be a difficult thing to locate on Earth, um, but that, you know, think in terms of a. 10 mile long vacuum tube um, laying up on the side of a mountain. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. And so back to that original question that you had, does do your payloads turn into pancakes as they exit the muzzle? No, it turns out that that issue was resolved a long time ago. Um, you know, folks worked out the reentry uh, stresses and necessary heat shielding to return ICBMs to Earth, right, to ground level, right? I mean, so that's that's a doable technology. It's been around a long time. And no, that's that's not really the issue. And in our case, it's sort of a design detail, but imagine, you know, that armature that has to be pulled forward in the middle being something that we want to reuse. So the last 10% of the launcher slows it down. And the casing in the center is the delivery cylinder that keeps going. And right. it can be made as strong as you want. And ob obviously, this is cargo only. I mean, I'm right. sort of thinking about the G-forces involved here. Yeah, right. High G-force, uh, cargo only, certainly raw materials, liquids, fuels, but roll stock, you know, roll stock of, of aluminum and other such things. And then, you know, I-beams and hardened electronics, and but raw materials only and cargo only. Mm -hmm. I mean, even like the things that you make the shell out of would probably have value in space. Exactly. And, um, you know, and that sort of another design detail is that we don't just our review of the technology. We don't think we're getting to eight kilometers a second. We think we can get to five, five and a half. Um, but if you look at the at the tyranny of the rocket equation, right? Uh, you you just recently went to your first rocket launch, and it, it's it's you 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 got to see that mostly what you're doing is lifting fuel to lift more fuel to lift other fuel to find you know, and it's all about acceleration. Well, if you can get a five kilometer a second head start on the eight kilometer a second problem, the 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 shape of the of the tyranny of the rocket equation is pyramidal. If you lop off the bottom two thirds. You've taken away way more than two thirds of the energy necessary to get to orbit. The last, the final stage on a rocket is really rather small. And so um, there would be a rocket booster associated with any launch. It would be a cargo tube and a booster. But so again, you think that's you know, inevitable? That has, 
Like I know like the it's, spin launch people are sort of expecting to have to do the same thing, which is that you're, I mean, the dream is that you're just hurling projectiles into space, which it's, you yeah. know, it's really hard to reach orbit with a single kick. Now impossible. You need I, a way I, to circularize I, your orbit. I doubt it, but never say never. Um, right. Yeah. It's the, it's the V squared problem. That son of a gun gets harder and harder at a, right. at a horrible clip as you go into these higher velocities. Um, so I, I think it's, we think five kilometers a second is doable. I'll put it that way. And now, we, now and it seems, so back to what you originally said, the, you know, the, the main application for this seems to be space itself. You mentioned the moon. What about just in space where? Sure. Yeah. I, you, you know, know we're focused on conversations with folks. We've had conversations with NASA now, a uh, number of folks there relating to support of their Artemis program and their missions to Mars program and their cis lunar activities. They have reasons to want to move raw materials off the moon where neighbors aren't a problem, vacuum's easy, cold is easy. And 1.7 kilometers a second is a whole heck of a lot easier than five kilometers a second. So um, it seems like a, a, a good place to start with the technology. Um, so, and they're, they're, you know, they're looking at um, regolith, raw materials, water, you know, there's a lot that can be moved off the moon um, to support missions to Mars, to cislunar space. There's even an opportunity to launch from the moon um, uh, throughout the solar system, right? If you do your timing right and you, you exit it just to pick a number two kilometers a second, you're not coming back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so. there's there's this idea of these interplanetary highways that there are these right. Lagrange balance points around each planet that exactly. you can sort of, you know, they're gateways to take you on to whatever next world you want to go to, gravitationally speaking. Um, and, and what about asteroids? I mean, I think, you know, again, the, you're, the conditions get even better, don't they? You've got dangerous asteroids you need to move. Right. Also vacuum, also extremely low surface gravity. Right. There's it, the thing about this particular technology, when you look at a quench motor and what all can be done with it, um, it has a lot of application. It's an, it's it's a fundamental kind of an idea. Electromotive force is capable of doing much more than what can be done chemically. This is what the DOD recognized way back in 1970 and said, we, we have to look past what's possible with chemical energy. And with electromotive force, you can go one whole heck of a lot higher up the energy curve than you can with just chemicals. It's just, it's just a physics fact. And so the, the problem was the technology available to them at the time. There was no way to switch high levels of current with the kind of precision that was needed. So they were stuck with the rail gun as the only approach. And so that's what they did. Um, technologies moved on, uh, high temperature superconductors that didn't exist then exist now. And there's, there's better designs. Um, uh, and, and we think ours is, and, uh, you know, we've, we've designed an experiment with the folks at Robertson research Institute who are, uh, expert, in high temperature superconductors. And, you know, there's a whole world of uh, magnets where people are, are setting higher and higher Tesla levels at, at places like the Robinson Research Institute and the National Mag Lab in Florida to, to um, set records for the highest Tesla fields that can be done. And it's, it's worked its way into fusion research. There's a lot of application for this kind of thing, not just launching stuff off the surface of the moon. So, so let's talk about your recent partnership with a uh, New Zealand university. Right. The Robinson Research Institute. Um, you know, uh, well, what, they're a fantastic outfit. They're, they're worth uh, interviewing on their own, but I'm not sure what you'd like to know. If, if you would like... Well, I guess what is the... I mean, you sent out the press release... <laughs> Um, yeah. talking about the partnership and to talk about the new tests that you are approaching. So I'd love to know, I mean, like I am steeped in science fiction and I love this kind of stuff. 
but I, I err on the side of practical and what is, what tangible steps are being taken to help me achieve my science fiction dreams. So that's right. what I'm really interested in is, well, is you know, what practical steps yeah. are, are so now happening. We're, we're there because of their expertise and high temperature superconductors. Um, the system needs to be high temperature superconductor, we think. There have been low temperature superconductors, meaning like liquid helium temperatures, and that's what's in your MRI machine for a long time. The problem is the economics of dealing with liquid helium in, in massive quantities. Um, and, and, you know, a liquid nitrogen temperature, as cold as that is, is a lot more doable kind of thing. And it turns out in magnet design, um, they get into the high temperature superconductors when they want to get into the strongest Tesla fields. So for whatever reason, it has become a center of excellence in the world. Um, and we went where the expertise are, not where, you know, who's in our neighborhood kind of thing. So that's, that's why we're there, their expertise in high temperature superconductors. And the, as I say, the engineering is daunting. When you have a hoop, say like a one meter hoop, just a demonstration size or even a half meter hoop, and you, you power it up, thousands of amps can go into a, into a circuit that's just you know without resistance, but there's a lot of hoop stress. It wants to expand. Well, if you put a, a a series of them in a row and you say, I'm going to pull something through them. Well, in the other direction, the stators are being pushed down, right? I mean, if it, I was exampling going up, but if you went sideways, if, if, if you're going to launch something in this direction, you know, it's, uh, who, right. who, who is it that your, you your MRI so rings it, um, want to, uh, shift and they want to torque sideways as you are running this electricity through and trying to use it to push a payload. I mean, yeah, it's, equal it's and Newton, opposite reaction. Newton, Newton all the way the down. Thinking of. So, yeah. And so anyway, so, and frankly, these materials are not, this is not like, um, you know, uh, steel wire where it's like really tough and will take all kinds of abuse. It's kind of the opposite. So there's some significant engineering problems to make sure that these things can sustain the violence of what's going to happen huh. to them. So that's there's, really interesting. That's, that they, so that's what that I meant the, about this. Yeah. So like the, I guess the using this stuff, using these high temperature superconductors provides sort of the physics that you need, but it isn't right. necessarily also the physical material. Like what you like is reinforced steel concrete right right yeah right <laughs> that was also a high, high temperature, temperature, temperature superconductor that would be steel perfect and concrete would be wonderful but so yeah so we yeah. have daunting engineering uh challenges but uh you know this is a group of folks who are university physicists darpa researchers engineers these are serious people that are looking at this saying this looks doable and not doable on the level of can it work once? Because as we've talked about, that doesn't help anybody. It looks doable in terms of repeat use, long-term robust electric motor, and therefore has application uh, in launchers, in uh, inertial confinement fusion. There's, there's other areas where people want to shove something really hard to put it as simply as you can. And electromagnetically is how you can do that. And it turns out being a non-contact way is important if you want to reuse it and having it be efficient, like 90 some, 97% efficient. So you're not producing an enormous amount of heat rather than motion. And uh, looks like the new, so I, I'm really very excited about it. I mean, it's changed the world stuff mm -hmm. uh, if we're successful. It, now I'm, I'm also sort of thinking about another analogy, which is like a solar electric, uh, power system, you know, an ion drive that you're bringing in yep. electricity, solar electricity from the sun, using that to accelerate ions out the back of, of the spacecraft right. at high velocity. And that gives you a kick in the opposite direction. You yep. would be in theory generating your electricity through solar power and 
you could be getting a kinetic kick out the other side in a way that sounds like it would be easier to refuel. Like if you can find an asteroid, crunch it up, and you've got the sun nearby, you're back in business again. Is yes. That, would, is that an application that you think would work? Sure. It, it's it, um, the simplest name for what we have is a mass driver. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, where do you want to use a mass driver? I was talking with um, Michael Schoenfeld at NASA. He's a team lead on their on their um, nuclear propulsion project. Um, and, uh, you know, I made the comment that we're working on each end of the spectrum from each other. He's up here at the already high velocity trying to shorten the length of time it takes to get to Mars. And I'm starting at the other end of the spectrum at zero, <laughs> you know, so, but, um, and in their, their case, they've got a little different approach to it than, than, um, generating electricity and using that to power an ion drive. They're, they're, trying to do it directly but uh another guy worth interviewing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, th I think i've talked to him in the past um but oh. i'm just sort of thinking about like i guess you know once you're trying to use your rail gun i mean obviously the or your mass driver it's, it's not a rail gun. Is, yeah, not a rail gun exactly mass driver once you're using your mass driver which i guess yes. a rail gun is a type of mass driver but just in general right. a mass driver um right you know, the application that we all jump to is, yeah, let's use this as a way to get payloads off of Earth. But then you have these constraints. You, you've you got to hit eight kilometers per second. You've got to get through the atmosphere. Yep. You've got to deal with the the volume. <laughs> you got to deal with all the, yep. the neighbors. Yep. But once you're in space, you could those problems go away. Those problems all go away. And now <laughs> you could start at, at sending things out at one kilometer per second, half a kilometer, like you can dial up the capability from the other end right. of the spectrum. And there's all kinds right. of value. I mean, uh, and what's happening now is the commercialization of, of space is becoming real, right? The costs, everyone should thank Elon Musk and SpaceX, 10x reduction, right? We went from $10,000 a pound to $1,000 a pound, and it's transformed what, what is possible, you know? And so it's all about cost per pound or per kilogram to orbit. And with the moon, commercialization is absolutely part of a NASA's plan. They don't want to just go visit for a while and walk around and come back, do some research. They want to commercialize the moon which means moving raw materials from the moon into lunar orbit. And there's a need in orbit for water to make fuel, to have shielding, to use for drinking. There's a need for the raw materials that are available on the moon to build things out of. So it is, it is how this thing goes forward. Whether or not our design is going to work, you know, time's going to tell, but, but we think so. But one way or another, electromagnetically, you can just apply a lot more force a lot more efficiently than you can with chemicals. So yeah, I, I think it, that is inevitably how it's going to go. And I guess I feel like we we have this, like space is different than the surface of Earth. And so the uh, we think about space, you know, we think about Star Trek. Mm -hmm. It's actually just, a, you know, it's a, it's a Navy and people are hopping in boats and they're going from from island to island. And that's not what space is. And so I think that that when we fundamentally think about what it's like, what it will be like to live and work in space, to send resources from planet to planet, from world to world, different velocities are fine. Um, how close you are to the sun, how much electricity you're going to get, where the resources are located in the solar system. Like, like it's a completely different place out there. And I think that having a technology that allows you to move this material from world to world at without having to light chemicals on fire um, gives you a lot of options that, oh, you know, I think so. and I, I think and, so. And, 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 the, and the, the speeds are different. And that's, and I find that really a sort of, I'm starting to kind of wrap my head around this, that, that maybe if you're going to send resupplies to a Mars station, you can send them on a slow boat. Like maybe it takes 10 years for the stuff to get there. Right. But, right. It, you know, as long as they arrive one every week, a new 
drop appears with with all of the volatiles and and stuff that they require, then everything's going to be great. Ultimately, economics rules the roost. Yeah, it will yeah. be the cost of doing things that will decide what gets done. And this approach is high upfront cost, and then very low operating costs. So in that regard, um, a good analogy is the railroads. Very high upfront cost to build the railroads in the 1800s. But their operating cost after that was very, very low. Same for this approach. High upfront cost, very low operating cost. And it when you change the economics of what it takes to move things around, whether it's up, you know, you said move from island to island, it's really like move from well to well, right? You know, we're living down on the bottom of this well. And once you get up and out of it from an energy standpoint, you're already 95% of the way wherever else you want to go, right? It's just time, as you point out, if you want to take a long time to get there. There's different visions of how this play out. Um, you know, Elon Musk is very um, committed to, and I, I celebrate his idea of um, going to Mars to stay. Um, but that's that's not how um, the folks at Blue Origin are looking at it. They're They're thinking, when you go into space, you're going to build in space, and be you know build structures that 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 are communities for people in space. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know. I guess I so, think they're both right. So what's the timetable? What what are you hoping is sort of like the next big practical step that you're going to be able to take? Well, unfortunately, uh, it's it's not as fast as any of us would like. Uh, we're looking at a solid two year effort here to get through what we need to do, just the delivery of the high temperature superconductor materials, which are well sought after for fusion research and other mm-hmm. kinds of things. We're probably looking at nine months on that alone. So it's a, a gated series of steps to build the stators and stress them and then, you know, do the, and it, working all through that's probably a, a two year process for a, um, a demonstration experiment that shows, you know, that that shows the physics and proves the engineering. Um, so it's it's going to be a while. Well, David, good luck with uh, the next step Thank on you. this. And uh, I look forward to hopefully that sci-fi future that we were all promised. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for sharing about what we're doing. And uh, we'll make it work. All right. Good luck. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Just Paul Davis, Vlad Shipplin, Jay Dennis, David Giltanen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verabioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.